Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrew Christian Church and happy Mother's Day. One of the Mother's Day stories for you today is the very first Easter and the recording of that that we have the oldest recorded gospel is the Gospel of Mark and it starts out early in the morning. The mother of James and Salome and Mary, the mother of our Lord, set out to the tomb. I mean, mothers are in the Easter story because of their persistence and their love. And so we celebrate mothers and how women and men do the love of mothers that are Christ-like. So happy Mother's Day. For those who are able, let us share in reciting our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive the sin thus. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For our children's moment, you know, with your mom, if you want to tell your mom you love her and you have her here on earth, you can run up, give her a hug, kiss her on the cheek and say, I love you. But how do you tell God or Jesus that you love them? That's a little different. They're not dead, but you can't quite put your hands on God or Jesus, can you? So one of the things the Bible tells us about kids is if you want to give a hug to Jesus or God, you can do that by doing something good for someone else. Um, it may not be a hug. Sometimes there's distance in there. Um, one of the things that COVID has kind of knocked us all for a loop on is timelines with little children. And some of you saw Amelia right after she was born, and then, boom, COVID hit. And it seems like she ought to be just crawling, but no, she's way past that. She's talking, she's got speeds of fast and faster and all that. But one of the things she does is you can blow her a kiss and she'll catch it and say, put it on my cheek. And then you can blow her a second kiss and she will say, put it on my heart. I know, and you know who taught her that? Her mom, not her papa, but her mom. Well, this works with Jesus and God, too. You can throw a kiss to Jesus and God by doing something good for someone else. And that's just like giving a hug or throwing a kiss to their cheek. It makes them smile. You know, one of the things that pleases mothers more than anything else is when they catch their kids doing the right thing. I mean, a hug couldn't get any better than that. Another thing is, is when you mess up, another way to show God you love God or Jesus is to say, I'm sorry, and then try real hard to do better the next time. People mess up. Everyone out there has messed up. And this world is not made up of perfect people, but people who are striving to be like the perfect example of Jesus. And that means sometimes we're not that example. And what you call that is grace. And grace is a wonderful thing, and that's one of the things your mom would be smiling at you is not that you do everything absolutely right, but when you do mess up, you say your story and try real hard to do what's right next. The church is no exception to that. A church should never be a place where outside worlds say, ooh, I'm not good enough to be there. It should be a place where people are real people, sometimes they mess up, and for messing up with the soul, the hospital is the church. And so we should look like a place that's picking people up 
and putting them into grace like God did for us. Now, one of those wonderful Mother's Day songs, and I don't want to make anybody cry, but uh, if Wade Wampler out in Arizona were listening to this this morning, this was Betty's favorite song in our hymnal. And I know there's a few other of you folks out there that had a mom that loved this song too. So sing with me, I was there to hear your morning cry. John in the fifth chapter. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whoever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and the blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is truth. There will be a fellowship Zoom following this service. Give Mrs. Sue Blaine this much time to get up the road to start that, but she will be there and let you in. 
food pantry donations. Kit made me cry this week. She was cleaning out her mother's house with her sister, and she called me and said, we want to give mom's food in her pantry, the canned goods and stuff, to Nemeth. In the midst of her crisis, she thought of those who are hungry. And that's what church is all about. So we arranged for Kit to get the food here. She did most of the work. I just left her a key. And thanks to her sister and her, there are people at NEMAP that will have more food to use. Thank you, thank you. Remember our food pantries. Women's Bible study is at 7.30 on Wednesday. Knitting for others is Tuesday from 4 to 5. And those who are inoculated can come join the Zoom in person from the church library or fellowship room, uh, depending on where the heat's on or the air conditioning's on. Camp Christian Workday. On Saturday, June 5th, anybody who would like help to get the camp open where it's been closed for a year is welcome to show up at camp at 7 a.m. If you're not an early riser and you show up at 9, there's still going to be work for you. So show up. They're going to stop around 5 o'clock, and they will feed you lunch, but they need to know you're coming. So if you would like to do this, go online and tell the camp uh, superintendent, I'll be there. There will be no fire circle service tonight due to rain. Um, from here till into the evening, I think the lowest chance of rain is like 83%. And like my grandpa from Oklahoma, he wouldn't bet on basketball between the Oklahoma game and Kansas, because he always said, that's gambling. And so, we're not gonna gamble either. We're gonna cancel and have everybody stay home and dry, and next week, we're gonna have our fire circle where it's safe for those who are unvaccinated with little kids and adults to come and share the good news of Jesus Christ. We are so thankful for our choir. They sounded great this morning. I don't know if you were in the narthex and heard that. I know the online folks couldn't, but you're going to really be blessed in a little bit with them. Camp Christian registration forms. If you said, I'm coming to camp for your kid or grandkid, now it's time to do the paperwork. You can get all those forms online and you go to CC and then INOH, which stands for Christian Church in Ohio. And they have all those forms that you can print out and fill out. Send the kids to camp. Camp is a teaching arm of the church. And in one week, they can often teach more than in a whole summer of Sunday school. So please, get the kids there. Garden. They are going to be planting the garden on Saturday at 10 o'clock. So coming up, it's not going to rain. I heard that from a high authority. Okay. And we are going to plant the garden. 10 o'clock. Come with your gardening gloves and shoes, and we are going to get stuff in the ground. Happy Mother's Day. On the table behind us where you picked up on your way in, communion cups are roses. And we invite the mothers to take a rose when they leave home. They're beautiful if you, I, I don't know if I can get the camera to turn around and see them, maybe later on but they're beautiful. Now, because we don't have the fire circle tonight, if you're going to see someone who normally attends the fire circle, but now they can't because we canceled it due to rain, and you would like to take them a rose, please do that and deliver one from our church to them. Thank you for providing those, St. Andrew. And now, a word from our board moderator, Mrs. Sue Blaine. going to move this so it doesn't block your face. Thank you. Like you, two weeks ago, my heart was breaking.
I was listening to a person who was exhausted by a spiritually, physically, and emotionally draining year, a year like no other in our congregation's history. The pandemic greatly reduced opportunities to talk to each other, to know what was going on in each other's lives, and to support each other in times of distress and turmoil. Morgan has tried to be all things to all who need him, but being human has its limitations, even for someone as incredibly talented as our minister. We are a faith community, a church family, and members of this family reached out to Morgan and asked him to reconsider. Like Jonah, we know that when God speaks, we need to listen. And I believe God was speaking to several of us to encourage this reconsideration. To me, it seemed like we needed to get back on the road to our Nineveh by following the recommendations that the visiting regional minister had made and our board approved in March. Our new regional minister, the Reverend Alan Harris, joined these discussions and has concurred with those recommendations. The first recommendation is a three-month sabbatical for Morgan to replenish his spirit and restore his energy as the spiritual leader of this congregation. A second recommendation is that the congregation, during this time of sabbatical, engage in a process of reflection to see if the goals developed several years ago are still pointing us in the right direction. We will revise as necessary so that the ministry programs focus and guide our energies and resources to becoming the congregation we are called to be. It is therefore with profound relief, renewed hope, and abundant joy, I announce that Morgan has rescinded his resignation and will continue as our pastor and will begin his sabbatical June 1st. Come September, he will return to us re-energized and ready to lead us anew. And I look forward to the future of this congregation as we continue to discern God's voice for guidance and direction. to think that got me to take a relook at ministry here, but one of the things that never stopped was a passion for this church of reaching out to new people. And coming out of COVID, we have been energized by new people and old people coming together and saying, we want to be a church in this community, and I want to be part of that. As we go forward, we have to realize that we aren't all perfect people, myself included, but we are folks that have been broken but are still good. This song, Truth Be Told, talks about how we try to present the perfect image to the world while we're broken inside and how we are moving to a better place when we acknowledge that. Lily, Michael.
just come as you are, but I doubt it. Cause if we live like that was true, every Sunday morning you would be crowded. Didn't you say church should look more like a hospital? Safe place for the sick, the sinner in the scot and the prodigals like me. But truth be told, Oh, am I the only one who says, yeah, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, and I'm not, I'm broken. When it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not, you know it. Don't know why it's so hard to admit it, being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fault, there's no sin you don't already know. Control. I say it's under control, but it's not, and you know it. I don't know why it's so hard to admit it. Being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know. Yeah, I know. Thank you, Lily and Michael. Our story that I'm going to read for the sermon takes Peter. Now, he's the rock. Literally, Peter means rock. That's what his name means. But that's not his original name. His original name was Simon, a very common Jewish name. But Jesus said, you're the rock. And on you, we will build a church. Now, when you realize this, you realize Peter doesn't get it right all the time. Peter is both heel and hero in these stories that we read from Acts. He is the first to proclaim Jesus is the Messiah. But then Peter is the one who tries to manipulate Jesus into being the Messiah that Peter wants instead of what God wants. Hence, he's the heel, and he gets a severe rebuke when he tries to bend the job of Messiah to Peter's own purpose. That's where he says, get behind me, Satan. That's what Jesus says to Peter. That's not a compliment. <laughs> I'm sorry, I left that on. That is not a compliment. And when Peter gets that, he kind of retreats a bit. Now, in that same room where Peter gets chastised to get behind me, Satan, he also steps up when Jesus says, I've been betrayed, will be betrayed. And Peter says, we're with you 100%. We will never leave you. Wow. What bold hero language that is, only to have Jesus say, you know, you're going to deny me three times later on tonight. And when Jesus ends with his arrest, there's not a disciple to be seen except, happy Mother's Day, the women. Yeah, Peter's gone, having denied Jesus three times. When a servant girl is jubilant and says, oh, I recognize you, you're one of them, referring to Jesus' faithful disciples. And he's, nope, you're mistaken. And he goes out. Three times he denies Jesus, and yet God's not finished with Peter yet. Heel and hero, all in Peter. Peter also opens the door to sharing the gospel, but not with folks who weren't Jewish. He opens the door to sharing the gospel, 
and it takes him about 20 years, two decades, to finally get God's call to him that it's also for the Gentiles. That's a long, slow burn to get there, but he does. Now, there are places in there where he gets it right, only to revert back to his childhood teaching that we're Jews and we stick together. But the challenge is learning a new tradition from the limits that we were taught as children sometimes that were wrong. And Peter's a victim of that. When they're at the well, Jacob's well, in Samaria, the disciples, including Peter, are stunned to come back with food from town and find Jesus talking to a woman at the well. Because she's a Samaritan, and the Messiah comes first to the Jews, Peter thought. Instead, Jesus keeps them there for three days because these Samaritan people, including the woman who is probably one of the stories of the biggest evangelist in the, in the Bible, has the whole town come and listen to Jesus speak the gospel of God. Wow. And they stay with the Samaritans for three days and receive the Samaritans' hospitality. And you would think that kind of respect that Jesus gives the Samaritans would turn this heart of stone into being receptive to God wanting all people. But Peter's surprised when Jesus goes across the Sea of Galilee. If this banner were the Sea of Galilee, the Jewish side is over here. This side is Gentile. And somewhere in the middle up here, they kind of mix and mingle. And then the Jordan River flowing out of the south of the Sea of Galilee keeps the two peoples separate, Jews and Gentiles. Well, Jesus heals a man on this side, they get in a boat and come over to this side, and there's a crazy man running around naked in the tombs. Do you see any problem with going up and approaching a man like that? I do. For one thing, if you're Jewish, being among the tombs is unclean. The other thing is the fear factor. This man was breaking rocks with his bare hands. Crazy and dangerous. And I'll tell you, seeing a man naked is not something we do, even in the locker room. When I was a kid, we had the old YMCA-style locker rooms, and you look here, right in the eye, and try to avoid everything below. Even men are like that. And yet, here's Jesus, opens a conversation about God, and the man ends up a follower of God. You would have thought, wow, Peter sees this and thinks, God's for everyone. Nope. Just today, God's for everyone. But tomorrow I'm going back to just taking care of the Jews. On Pentecost Day, in Jerusalem, Peter does one of his best sermons ever, and they have thousands of people who want to be baptized and join the Jewish movement to follow Jesus. They still didn't see themselves separate from the Jewish faith. They saw themselves as reforming the faith to get closer for the Jewish folks. But there's Gentiles in the crowd too. And then they spend so much tr time trying to teach the new recruits that they forget to go out and get more recruits and so Peter stays in Jerusalem and keeps working on getting more Jewish folks to reform and be close to God. And he forgets about the Gentiles. And last week's story, Philip, well, that's the Holy Spirit drives Philip out to the Gentiles, and he's super successful. But not Peter. Peter even has... Um, Paul, you know, the Johnny-come-lately, I'm killing Christians, now I'm not, I'm making Christians. That's Paul's conversion into the faith, his conversion experience. 
Now Paul, who also is Greek by his father's side, Jewish by his mother's side, decides he's taken the gospel to the Greek peninsula, and he asks for Peter's blessing, and Peter's like, um, okay, go, but I bet he won't be successful. <laughs> and, and you have a good third of the gospel of Acts based upon Paul's reaching out to the Gentiles, and you have a couple of stories where God, through the Holy Spirit, blows Peter into a Gentile situation where, for instance, the story of him going to Cornelius, who is both a leader of armies for the Romans, but he's also tied to governing that section of town. I mean, no king in Cornelius' territory makes a decision for the public without his blessing. He's more powerful than the king. Yes, Mel Brooks may say it's good to be the king, but it's better to be Cornelius. Yes, this is a big deal. And for Cornelius to have Paul, uh, uh, Peter come to his house and tell the gospel, Peter has three different dreams of this wonderful picnic blanket coming down. And on it is all this wonderful Jewish food. And then he looks closer and there's this Gentile food too. And he's told to grab something and eat. It's all good food given by God. And Peter says, no, it's unclean. I can't have that ham salad. He has this dream three times before there's a knock on the door and a servant girl from Cornelius says, he's heard about Jesus, he wants to know more, will you come to his home? And Peter finally gets that those visions are a sign from God that he should go to the Gentiles. And so he goes and the whole household hears the good news of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, what he taught, how he loved, and the whole household is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was a long road for Peter to get there, but he finally got there. And this is part of Peter's story when he finally opens up and changes from an old prejudice to a better way of living. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on all the Gentiles. For they had heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they invited him to stay for several days. Most of us here don't have Jewish roots, and had this not happened, the gospel would have never come to our ancestors or been shared widely outside the Jewish church. But here we are today, celebrating that God loves everyone. Our choir will be singing a song about alone, yet not alone.
most of my sermon was before the scripture so you could understand just how wonderful that scripture is. Now, persistence over time means a lot. And being Mother's Day, once in a while, my mom would take off from Illinois or Indiana where we lived, even way back when I lived in Kansas in Missouri, to get home for Mother's Day. And my grandma loved to collect people in her family and take them to church on Sunday morning. She was a charter member of her church up on the mountain. This is eastern Kentucky, right where the Appalachian Mountains come down to the Kentucky River. At one time, lots of coal was coming out of those mountains and was headed down to all the big businesses in the east and the west and down the Mississippi on coal barges and headed down with the locks. Then the railroads came. That business converted. And now they don't run coal out of those mountains anymore. But my grandma raised 10 kids in those mountains and every one of them, wherever they lived, were members of a church with their family. My oldest uncle was a member of the non-instrumental Church of Christ down in Texas. I can remember family reunions where they had heated discussions while playing rummy at the dining room table about whether you should have a piano or an organ or any musical instrument in the church. Yep, now we look back and think, why? But they were in a church. And whether you have a piano or an organ or a guitar or none of that, the church is bigger than all of that. And all ten kids found a church, and it was all due to Grandma. She would get them up through all their showers and baths on Saturday night, so that on Sunday morning they could get up, have breakfast, and all load in and head up the mountain to church. And there, she would go in with all the kids to church and neighbors, and Grandpa would sit outside in his pickup truck. Thirty years he drove Grandma to church, and they'd come to this arrangement where they agreed to disagree about being part of a church. Grandma was all for it, would even have the pastor come over for what kind of dinner? A chicken dinner, of course. And Grandpa would talk to the minister, but would he go to church? No. Sometimes we carry baggage from our past, and if you heard just the root of the family tree without the whole story, you would have thought that it was Grandpa dragging everybody to church. Because Grandpa, his father, was an evangelist. And this is back in the day where you rode a horse from town to town. And they set up a tent and you had these old time tent revivals. And I understand he was quite a good evangelist in telling the story of Jesus Christ. But he wasn't very good about living it. When he came home drunk to his family... He beat his wife, he beat his kids, he would drink the money that they had given him for holding the evangelism conference wherever it was in Kentucky or Tennessee or southern Indiana. And they were really in want. Grandpa and Grandma were both uh, born right around the turn of the century. My grandmother loved to say, I'm one year older than the year. She was born in 1899. One year older than the year. And you realize when they were having kids is in the period of the Great Depression. That's why my mom, to her dying day, could not throw out a Ziploc baggie that still worked. She would wash it out, and when we cleaned out her cupboard, there were a whole cabinet full of Ziploc baggies that had been washed out just in case. She never bought those because you got them free, buying food, yes. But that was being a child of the Depression. But my grandpa, his life got better when he was 10 his, his father went out to get a stick of firewood for the fire and didn't come back. 
he went to work for a local farmer and at 10 years old working for a local farmer and coming home and giving the money to his mother so that the younger siblings could have food and she could buy what she needed and they could work in the garden and raise what they could, his life got better. That was actually better because he didn't get beat to where he was an inch of not breathing anymore. And life got better. When he got married, his plan for fatherhood was to be as different from his father as he could be, which meant he was a pretty good father. He was compassionate, he was gentle, he was caring, and he was a good provider. But for 30 years, he wouldn't go to church with Grandma, and Grandma never quit. She kept going to church because she believed that she needed that help for her own soul and her kids. And she persisted in telling him he was welcome to come in with her. And finally, after 30 years, a preacher going to the College of the Bible, I mean, he was still green behind his gills, when he came up to the house and invited Mr. Wise, that was their last name, to come to church with their charter member and respected Mrs. Mary Wise. And Grandpa did. Because it wasn't the pastor's invitation, it was 30 years of Grandma's persistence that finally wore his soul down to be open to God. It had been so injured it took 30 years of healing, and it finally won him over. This is the story today of Peter. His soul was so injured from some of the stereotypes he'd been taught about Jews being separate from Samaritans, Jews before Gentiles. That's what he was taught ever since a little kid, and nobody questioned it because everybody he was around believed it. But God finally prodded Peter to reach new people, the Gentiles, and make disciples. And so he goes out to Cornelius' house. This is an international businessman on Pentecost. Cornelius was both businessman, military man, and governor. But you also on Pentecost have Peter saying, but I'm also reaching the Jewish families too. Jewish families celebrating a religious holiday are invited to follow God too. That was the easy one to Peter to reach out to. But you also have the story of Peter getting caught and thrown by the Jewish political folks into jail. This is to teach him not to say that Jesus stuff. And in the jail, he converts the jail jailer. They're singing hymns in a horrible place, in a horrible condition. They're singing hymns about how great God is, how wonderful Jesus taught them. And when the jail sails shake in an earthquake, and that's not too surprising because the area of the Middle East that Jesus is from and where Peter lived is very seismic. When the pivots of those jails bend so far, the doors pop open, and instead of leaving and having the jailer killed for an escaped prisoner, they stay, and the jailer comes down, and as he's getting ready to kill himself, the dust clears enough where Peter says, don't do it, we're all here, we don't want you to die. And at that point, this jailer takes Peter into his Roman citizen home and ask him to preach the gospel to his whole family. Peter was coming around. Then you have the Jewish widow women. They have this problem where the Jewish widow women feel like because we're Jewish, we have a little more sway over the Gentile widow women who have joined our discipleship group. You know, after all, we were Jewish then followers of Jesus, so we're a little closer to God. And instead 
of playing favorites. It's Peter who stands up and says, these folks and these folks are both valued. We'll appoint seven deacons to care for the members of our church. And of course, the ones who needed most care in their situation were widow ladies who had no children surviving them to take care of them. So that's the most vulnerable. You know, that's like this church trying to feed the hungry at the food pantries. The most vulnerable. And Peter's doing that, finally. And today, after a long journey of God showing that God really does love all, he goes to a Roman army commander, district governor named Cornelius, and all of Cornelius' family and friends who are there say, we want to be baptized and followers of Jesus. Guess what, folks? Coming out of COVID, the next generation that is starting to explore faith, like small groups of small churches in a community. Somebody out there should have said, that's us! We're there! We're ready! We want them! And to do that, it means we don't worship in one way, we worship in ways that make sense and reach people. Now, the next generation that's coming on with kids aren't like the boomer generation where you have big Sunday schools, big gatherings. Those are the mega churches. But what the next generation like is relationship, small group gatherings. Oh gosh, we've got some of that going. Sounds like a garden group. Sounds like a woman's Bible study. Sounds like... We already know how to do that sort of. We just need to do more of it. And guess what? This is not a big, unfriendly group. This is a group here at St. Andrew Christian Church that is open to new people. One of the things that we have been blessed with without realizing for years and years that I'll throw out there is, did you know there's a whole bunch of folks that want to be near where their grandkids live? near where family lives. And so when they retire to be near family, near grandkids, near nieces and nephews, they move to Columbus. Now, some of us are lucky that we're already there. You know, I'm looking at Phyllis Hoggett, and she's near a lot of family. But it wasn't always that way. She and Charlie were rogue renegades, left Dark County, came to this county, and lo and behold, now they're all here. And Sue Blaine... Uh, she and Randy came from Portsmouth, Ohio, landed in Columbus where there was job. But where did her parents retire to? When Reverend and Mary Alice Wilburn retired, they moved close to kids and grandkids. This is a long trend that's been around a while, and yet there's still people doing that, and I think it makes perfect sense. Don't tell Florida that I'm not coming there when I retire. I'm staying close to family and grandkids. I might visit, but I'm staying close to family and grandkids. And we've been having this a long time happen, you know. How did Sue Alt end up at St. Andrew Christian Church? Oh, her daughter Diane ended up in Columbus from the Ohio State University and then never left the city. Did I emphasize the enough? And when Sue retired from helping people that have disabilities over by Dayton, here she is helping grandkids and anybody those grandkids brought into her life. My goodness, we need to say, oh, wake up, St. Andrew. This is a market we're good at. We just need to let more people know that we're here and they are welcome. We're not just mining for kids at the young end but kids in their second childhood after they retire. Any of you folks retired out there still like kids, just your body's a little older, but your kids still in here in a good way. We got to figure out how to do more of that. That's part of the stuff I'm going to be working on while I'm on sabbatical. Newly arrived grandparents, we're going to find a way to invite more. In fact, before we even started this, we had some show up. Thank you, Thelma and Linda. You're part of the sermon today, as well as some that's been hanging around a long time and joined the church, and we forgot to notice where they came from. And parents with we folks, well, you know, you don't catch 
parents now wanting to stick we folks down the hallway while parents are down here. They want to do stuff together. After all, society out there fragments stuff where parents go one way, kids go another. And the parents want to be with their kids. You know, we do that at the fire circle right now. I think we need to explore expanding that in more ways. And like I said, Gen Xers want to do small group home Bible studies. I have a friend that does a home Bible study. He was actually in Rachel and Tim's wedding. And one of the things I'm going to do is go to John, that's his name, and say, John, you've been running a Bible study out of your home for 10 years, ever since he was in high school. And he's not now. And I want to find out how he does that and attracts those Gen Xers that are young couples, some with a kid or two, and it works. That's another thing I'm going to do is track down John Patch and maybe drink coffee with him and explore that a little more, and he'll probably give me some more leads. That's another thing I'm doing over my sabbatical. Who knows, we might even do this while on a boat. After all, we're supposed to do rest and relaxation, so why not mix it with pleasure too? Already, St. Andrew has a statement that says God loves everyone, including people from the LTBQ and any other letters out there that you want to tack on. The church is diverse and loves people. This is something we need to help people know that they are welcome here, and they don't want to be treated differently. They want to be treated as part of the whole, as special people just like you and me are special people to this church. We are well posed for really putting the all into God loves all. Peter gets called on the carpet for just preaching to the choir. We can't just care for those that we know and love dearly in this church and think that we're actually being a church. Peter did that and God called him out on it again and again and again. We've got to not be satisfied with just looking for disciples that look like me. Believe it or not, it's one of the things that is now a negative for me. When I came out of seminary and I was a tall, white, young man with a family, I was exactly what every racist church wanted out there. I can't change those things about myself, that's just who I am. But I do need our church to know that there is more people than just tall, white males that look like me. In fact, over my sabbatical, you guys are going to have a chance to call people to this pulpit who look different than me, but are still a child of God. Thank goodness, right now we got an example as a retired pastor in our midst. I don't look exactly like Barbara Pratt. She's female, I'm male, and we're okay with that. But God calls all people, even people, to leadership. I can't, oh, I guess I could dye my hair red, or I could dye my hair black. I could get it permed, but it doesn't change my DNA. And my DNA says, for every human being out there, we're almost exactly alike, and we have within us a soul that was created uniquely and gifted by God. So we're alike in many ways and blessed to be different in others. So I can't be satisfied with just calling people who look like me. We can't be the church I grew up in in 1965 and expect to reach people who look differently and think differently now. The challenge for the church is how do I need to bring Jesus today so that you get Jesus nourishing your soul and someone else who's never been in a church 
has Jesus nourishing their soul? And I tell you, it won't be the same because, well, face it, Caroline and PK grew up in churches in Indiana. They have a running start on what they know in the Bible from someone who was never given that benefit. But we got to be persistent and we got to get them here because you can't do that if they never show up. And finding ways to attract people, have them make the simple first step of showing up is huge. And I want to be a little bit like Grandma and think, I can't give up on people whom I love that haven't showed up yet. I want to be persistent. The best mothers draw out their children to follow where God has gifted them. We have a few teachers out there, and that's something that teachers strive to do every day. They know that not everyone learns and receives information and processes it the same way. They're different, gifted in other ways as well. We need St. Andrew to pray earnestly. What does God need us to become? That's our prayer. Mothers pray hard for their children on what that child needs to become. Not my dreams for my children, but what my child is gifted and created by God to be. I pray that they discover and become that. We need to listen to the community around it and match it with the power of the Holy Spirit's driving wind of mission and ministry. Mothers empower their children to make the world a better place. They give them the opportunity. My grandma wise sold eggs and butter to cover all the expenses that a public education didn't cover for all 10 of her kids. She empowered them to a level that her husband never got to reach. He never got to graduate from high school because he had to work, had to feed younger siblings, help his mom. But she wanted something better for them and the potential of a bigger, better education posed them to be gifted using God's gift in ways they never could have done. We need to grow to the potential that Jesus wants for St. Andrew Christian Church. Mothers are not satisfied giving only the life the mother had. They want better life for their children, and we want that for our community around us. Let's be the church that God's calling forth and not be like Peter being slow and stubborn, but let's be a little more eager to seeing the signs that God calls forth and say, yes, we want to respond now and not take 20 or 30 years more before we get the wind of the Holy Spirit in our sails and reach our congregation and people around us to grow in the faith of Jesus Christ. An illustration I used earlier was the woman at the well. This song prepares us for communion and is based on the woman at the well.
I failed to uh, secure two elders, it would be wonderful if we had a couple of women that would like to pray for the communion while I explain about the communion cup. These communion cups are easier to use if you take the tab that is right here and push it down first till you feel a little click. And then when you release it, there will be a translucent film that you can peel back to reveal the bread. It's much easier to take the bread out before you take and peel the foil film back. After you receive the bread, we're going to pray over it first. You're going to come back and the tab you push down, now you're going to raise it up and peel it back to reveal the cup and the foil film will come off and then you may take the cup. All right. Let us pray. Dear God, you gave us the bread in the upper room, knowing there were some of us who were gathered at the table who weren't pure of heart, some of us who have denied you by how we lived, some of us who have outright betrayed you, Lord. When it was me, I can only say, please forgive me. When it was others, I can say, please forgive them too. For this bread is shared widely, not for the perfect, but those who are broken and need the healing of Jesus Christ. Through your brokenness, Lord, you offered healing. May we be healed by the broken healer. Likewise, God, We know that you sent Jesus into our midst, and at that last supper, he blessed a cup. And after speaking about forgiveness, he offered forgiveness to his disciples, the men, women, and children who were in that upper room. And they took of this cup, and he hoped that they would live differently because of it. This is grace, for this cup of grace We give you thanks. Amen.
Last week, um, Eldon was home, but the week before, he was back at Kobacker House. And um, he is home, but he is weaker than he was in the past. He is losing muscle mass, and he used to rely upon that to help with his balance. He has a bad foot and has for decades. He was tilling the church garden with a back, bad foot for <laughs> over a decade. Well, now with the loss of muscle mass, he oftentimes can't get up but without assistance. So please keep Bert and Eldon in your prayers. It is not, Bert says, a good idea to go and visit. They are vaccinated, but at this point, they still need to keep it a safe zone because with Eldon's uh, condition, you don't know how effective an immunization can be. So for Eldon's sake, call Bert, <laughs> send cards, and that would be very helpful. We also added a prayer request for John Randolph, our board secretary, Megan Kelsinski. This is a friend of her family. He was hospitalized on Friday following a heart attack and will have stents placed in at Mount Carmel Hospital today to help with that condition. So keep John in your prayers. Bob Wolf had a very bad fall um, towards the end of the week. He has many stitches that they had to put in. Because of blood thinners, um, he, they had a hard time getting the bleeding stopped. He is home recovering, but keep Bob and Jane in your prayers. Sarah Watts, this is Kit's mother, passed away. This is Asia's great-grandmother. She died last week in Zanesville, which is where Kit grew up. And so we ask for your prayers for her family, her sister, for Asia, for your daughter. And also we give thanks for the hospice care in the Zanesville area that provided excellent care for Kit's mother. Alec Kaczynski, this is Megan and Rick's son. Grandparents are Harold and Julie Wilkins, and you're thinking, Julie, I know that name, which she's one of our garden ladies. Well, Alex will have um, surgery to correct sleep apnea. He's only three years old. He wakes up, due to the sleep study, about 11 times an hour during the night. So keep him and your par his parents and grandparents in your prayers. Donald Wells, this is Megan's father. Liam and Megan attend our fire circle and our seeker circle. Um, but um, um, he moved from the hospital in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, closer to home because he's healthier and doesn't need as high a level of skilled care. Megan actually has gone out to see her father this weekend. So pray for a safe journey for her and I think at this point, dealing with the depression of long-term COVID conditions, Donald needs to see her more than ever. I think this will really help him gain strength. Jerry Revis has congestive heart failure. That's why Don is not here today. If she's having a bad morning, he stays to care for her. At this point, she needs surgery to replace a couple of heart valves and Jerry in her 90s says, maybe I don't want to do surgery. So it's a, a tough situation to be in at this point. Um, I know Dawn can put Jerry on the phone when she's having a good day. Um, but Dawn is always happy to talk to people. And I put, again, their address in the Friday news if you would like to send cards. There are now only 21 churches that need new pastors out there. There were 22 up until earlier this week. And uh, now, but you realize with 21 churches searching and so many pastors who are boomers retiring and some pastors that have left the ministry, it may take four or five years for these churches to do a search and find a pastor. Many of them are competing in a market and can't come up with a package to offer a pastor, and they may even be decade without a pastor they can afford. 
Pray for our fellow churches out there. Just because you have a pastor doesn't mean you can't pray for them. Let us now be in prayer. Dear God, you are a gracious God. You have brought us on a rainy day to celebrate mothers and hope for our church here in our church that meets across Ohio and meets in many places around the world. Let us lift them up and be your church in prayer. All this we pray. Amen. Go in the peace of God to give Jesus a hug by doing something good for someone else. Now I said that to the adults. The kids have been doing that for the last hour now. So we're all going to be on that same page. Happy Mother's Day and remember to take a rose. I'm all prayed up. I'm ready to meet my Savior. Eternal life is waiting by and by. I'm all prayed up. My faith will never waver. Doors on a swing wide open when I cry. Now I made my peace with Jesus a long, long time ago. Trusted him and he would save my soul. I walked up there beside him. He guides me on my way. I know he hears me when I kneel and pray. I'm all prayed up. I'm ready to meet my Savior. Eternal life is waiting by and by. I'm all prayed up. My faith will never waver. And the door's gonna swing wide open when I die. Now I ain't afraid of Satan, his wicked way of sin. He tempted me but could not pull me in. When I've gone to live with Jesus, I face my judgment day. He'll fill me for the promise that he made. I'm all prayed up. I'm ready to meet my Savior. To do like you wait by and by. My baby never waver And doors don't swing wide open when I die Go in peace Nice finish